So we'll hopefully finish chapter nine today, and hopefully thank you. Um, and then we'll do the uh, leash lab upstairs, and I think you'll enjoy that lab. It's it's just kind of a cool lab. I don't know, I like it. Okay, so uh, we're, we'll do uh, Lewis chapters today. How many of you remember Lewis chapters from Chem 107? And how many of you remember kind of liking it? No. Okay, well, if you didn't like it, hopefully you'll like it now. Um, it'll be really good for you to be good at your Lewis structures, your Lewis theory, because um, especially when you get to uh, organic, if you're going to take organic chemistry, so you know it won't. But, um, organic chemistry is all structures. Right? It's all drawing structures and pathways. So um, if you like biochemistry, it's also Lewis structures. Um, Engineering, I don't know, I'll tell you. <laughs> you may or may not be soon. Um, so we'll do Lewis stresses of, uh, of ionic compounds and covalent compounds. Right? So usually um, in Chem 107, you may have only learned it from a covalent compound standpoint, but we'll do, we'll do some ionic compounds. Um, and then lastly, uh, once we have our ability to draw structures, then we can do uh, another estimation of, bond, of enthalpy reaction using bond energies. And that's Kind of, kind of a lot of fun. Okay, so, of course, my idea of fun might be your idea of misery. Uh, hopefully, this won't be too miserable. Okay. Um, so we, we left off on this last time. We talked about bond um, polarity. We talked about uh, electronegativity. Um, again, where do these numbers come from? These these electronegativity values. They come from a table, and the table is just a table of made up numbers to give you a relative scale of which atoms want electrons more than others when they're bonded to other atoms. Okay, so that, that, that's where we left off on. Um, we had, a, you know, we talked about the difference in electronegativity and how you can use, the, use it to estimate if a bond is ionic or covalent or, or if it's covalent, it's polar or not polar. But again, these numbers are just rough estimates. Ultimately, you still have to go by the old rules of, okay, is it a metal and a non-metal bonding? Then it's an, 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 an ionic bond. Um, and so if electronegativity is high enough, it's a, at the very least a polar bond, um, it'll have a dipole moment uh, towards the direction of the higher electronegativity, okay, that we, we call that a bond dipole. But what I'm more interested in, you know, I don't, I don't care about bond polarity, what I care about is molecular polarity, because it's the molecular polarity that affects um, the phases of matter, it affects the solubility of compounds, it affects the ability to do chromatography, which was my background in industry. So I'm, more, I'm much more interested in the application of that because it's, it's just more, more applicable. Okay, so, but to talk about molecular polarity, we have to do Lewis structures first, um, and then talk about Vesper, and then after we discuss shapes and compounds, then we can talk about molecular polarity. So, so first step is Lewis structures. Um, this will be review for you to a certain extent, but there's some new new uh, stuff thrown in. Okay, um, so Lewis structures are a two-dimensional way to draw molecules. What do I mean by two-dimensional? I'm talking about like flat, but not not 3D, right? Just two dimensions, right? It's just, it's just a plane of paper or the plane of the board, right? Two-dimensional. Um, it's really important for you to keep that in mind because Lewis structures in and of themselves don't necessarily tell you the polarity of the compound. Right? You have to look at the shape. That's that's next chapter. Okay. Um, chemical bonds occur by sharing or exchanging valence electrons. Okay. This is in the case of covalent bonding. So with lattice energy, we were talking about more of the ionic bonding model. With Lewis structures, um, we're talking more about the covalent bonding model. Okay. Um, and so when you have a bond in, in covalent molecules, the electrons are shared. Do you remember that? Shared electrons, covalent molecules, and non-shared for ionic. Um, that's something they even say in high school, I believe, if you may remember, um, if you had high school chem. So um, that, that concept is still there. Valence electrons are represented by dots, okay, and hence they sometimes call these dot structures instead of Lewis structures. Um, I don't like using the word dot structure though because in, at least in, in the way I do it, I don't show dots for all the bonds, I just show dots for the non-bonding lone pairs on the outside, right? 
and so on. Okay, uh, the number of valence electrons are based on quantum theory. Okay, so um, so for example, if you look at the group number of an element, you can get the valence electrons for that half. I can still use that. So here's the the, the my my written out directions for how to do an allele structure, and you have to follow this to the T because if you don't, you'll miss something and get it wrong. Um, how many of you have ever uh, miscounted the valence electrons in a compound when you're doing the Lewis structure? You're like, yeah, everybody in the room, right? Even me? Okay, so um, really easy to, to mess up on the accounting. Um, so step one, in Chem 107, you may have been taught that the first step is to always count valence electrons. I'm going to tell you that that's actually the second step. The first step is, is the compound ionic or covalent? You have to ask yourself this question. Because what if I give you a compound and I say, I give you the structure for ammonium carbonate. Okay, you cannot bind covalently ammonium ion with carbonate ion because it's an ionic compound, it's not covalent. So um, what happens in that case is you do a Lewis structure for each cation and anion separately, and that gives you a molecular picture of what happens when you dissolve, say this salt dissolves in water, for example. So we'll go through those, um, but just know that the first step is always is the compound ionic or covalent. Okay. Um, the second uh, step is then count valence electrons, but if it's not a compound, you have a valence count for each ion. Okay. Um, then you assemble the primary framework. Um, if it's ionic, you assemble the individual framework of each ion separate from the other anions. Cations are separate. Um, you add the pairs of non-bonding electrons in step four to each outer atom first, starting with the most electronegative first. All right, that might be a little more detailed than maybe what you got in Chem 107. So there's a there's a order with which you should assign lone pairs to outer atoms. All right, it's not just any; it's most electronegative gets them first, and it's because they want electrons more. Right? Um, if you have any more. Uh, electrons to assign, you add them to the inner atoms. Again, starting with electronegative first. Uh, what do I mean by an inner atom versus an outer atom? Like if I if I you know made this compound, right? Um, let's look at. Uh, let's look at. Um, Let's look at acetic acid. Okay, this is a compound of acetic acid. Okay, how many inner atoms do I have in this compound? Three. I've got three inner atoms, right? They're they're in they're in amongst the outer atoms. How many outer atoms do I have? Five. I've got five outer atoms, right? So just to understand what I mean by inner versus outer atoms. Okay. Um, and then uh, the last step, uh, um, um, actually, I don't, I'm missing the last couple here, but we'll get to those. Um, the next step would be to optimize the Lewis structure using what we call the octet rule and also formal charge. You may not have heard of the term formal charge in Chem 107. Um, if you had me, I tried to sugarcoat it a little bit and I called it matching the valence of the free atom. You may, you may remember the same thing like that. You're like, no, I don't remember it. It was last, last summer. But anyway, but now we're going to call it formal charge. Okay. Um, now, what is the octet rule? What does that mean? Eight electrons per Eight electrons around every atom, right? But does hydrogen get an octet? No, Actually, hydrogen doesn't, right? It's, it, it only makes it only has one valence electron, so hydrogen atoms are always outer, and they never get one pairs assigned to them. So that's one exception to the octet rule. There's actually more to it, though. Okay, just the, than, than just that. So with the octet rule, in Chem 107, they, the instructor lied through their teeth. Okay, and, and I've been guilty of this myself too. All right, so if you have me, I, I lied to you a little bit. But I maybe, you yeah, know, I was just like, you jerk. No. Um, so um, after a 10 years Dodger game, you have the audacity to tell me you lied to me. Okay, um, so. It turns out that there's only four atoms that must have an octet. The only atoms that absolutely have to have an octet are these four atoms. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Okay, xenon, a 
as I call them. Okay, and if you look at CNOC, they're all together in the periodic table. Um, so only those four elements must have an octet of eight electrons around them in the Lewis model. Okay, if it's if it's beyond fluorine, if the atom is larger than fluorine, it actually can have more than eight. And if it's before carbon, you can have elements that have less than eight around them. Okay, so in Chem 107, I'm going to ask you to unlearn that. Your instructor told you all atoms get an octet except for hydrogen. Unlearn that and relearn it this way. <clears throat> Only CNOP must have an octet. They're like, hey, why didn't they just teach us that in the first place? Mm -hmm. And you know what? I'm asking myself the same. I ask myself the same question every day. I teach. I ever, ever teach this. You know, I don't know why they can't just teach that to you <coughs> in the beginning, but I don't know. It's just the way they write. Te they 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 read text or or they write textbooks like that. <clears throat> it's just this way of teaching that's been ingrained in, in the American way of doing things. I don't know. Or or, or maybe they do it in Europe too. I don't know. But so unlearn that everything gets an octet, and relearn that only CNOF needs an octet. Okay. The other elements can have less if it's before carbon, or more if it's after fluorine. And you'll see this play out um, with a lot of the things we do. <clears throat> so if they don't have their octets, make double or triple bonds until CNOF has an octet. Okay, that, that's uh, fairly familiar. The other rule is formal charge. So after the octet rule has been met, and I really emphasize that after the octet rule has been met, the charges that atoms quote unquote appear to have are optimized by having a formal charge as close to zero as possible by making double or triple bonds. I'm going to say this in an entirely different way. If you have an element by itself that's a free atom, it's got a certain number of valence electrons. The goal is to try and match the number of dots around an atom in a structure to that of the free atom valence count. All right, that's another way of saying it. So carbon always makes four bonds. Why is that? Okay, it's because carbon has four valence electrons. It's group four in the free atom table. You're matching the valence of that free carbon atom to what goes on in the structure. Carbon makes four bonds, it gets four dots closest to it, and that matches the free atom. Okay, and the difference between that valence count <coughs> in most structures for carbon is zero. So we would say the formal charge is zero in that, in that context. Okay, so the um, equation I have here for formal charge, so Fc, it's very fitting that we are here at Fullerton College, Fc. <coughs> um, formal charge of an atom, I, I just liken this to the group number of the atom. Okay, and this is using the American um, labeling of the periodic table. So, for example, um, carbon is group 4A, um, boron is group 3A. Okay, now if, you're, if you only have the um, international labeling, you would just subtract 10 from all the group numbers um, after, um, after, after nickel. Okay, so, so copper, group number 11, subtract 10 from that, you get a valence electron count of one for copper, right? And that matches the, um, the electron configuration for copper. Um, and some of you have asked me about this from chapter eight. You know, copper is a, is a 4s1, uh, 4s1, 3d10, and that 4s1 is the one valence electron in copper, and that would be the, the one, or 11 minus 10 is one for copper. <clears throat> um, zinc always forms two plus ions because it's the 4s2, 3d10. So that forest two count comes off, remember, for, for transition metal ions. Um, boron gets three valence electrons, carbon gets four valence electrons, nitrogen, group number five, um, is five valence electrons, oxygen now always has six valence electrons, fluorine, all the halogens get seven valence electrons, and the noble gases, they don't react, and the reason why they don't react is because they're already happy, they have their octets already, and so they already have eight, and that's, they don't react. Um, the only exceptions are krypton and xenon. There have been some chemistry observed in those noble gases, <clears throat> but under some very extreme conditions, in really hot conditions, sending an electrical arc through, through you know, very unnatural conditions. Uh, but for the most part, the noble gases don't react <clears throat> because they've got their octet already. 
So you got the group number of the free atom, okay, minus the number of bonds, plus the number of dots on the atom. Okay, so one bond counts as one, one valence electron, and then if they have a lone pair, they've got two dots on there, that would also count towards the valence. So as we go through this, you'll see, the, you'll see this over and over again. Okay, so which rule wins out? Does the octet rule win out, or does the formal charge win out? Um, sometimes you cannot always reduce the formal charge of all the atoms to zero, okay, without violating the octet rule. So in that case, the octet rule always wins. Okay, for cm. Okay, for all other for all other atoms though, the formal charge wins out. So for cenoff, octet rule must always be obeyed no matter what. Okay, for the other atoms though, the formal charge will win. I'll give you an example. If you look at uh, boron trichloride, okay, here's Here's the structure for boron trichloride. And I can't seem to draw a B today. I don't know. Okay, so this would be this would be the loose structure for, for boron trichloride. Um, we'll go through the process and how to get there, okay, with all those examples we'll do. But um, if you look at the boron, you know, it doesn't get an octet. Okay. So do we have to bring a lone pair in? so that boron has an octet, we don't because boron is not carbon. We don't have to have an octet for it. So we can leave it with only three bonds, and in that case, the formal charge wins out. Okay, it forms three bonds, its valence count is three. Okay, it's group number three for boron. Right, so the formal charge for boron in this case would be um, group number three from the periodic table, Okay, so this is so this three is from from the periodic table, and it would be minus <clears throat> the number of bonds and dots together in the structure. So there's only three bonds, so you subtract. Three and then there's zero lone pairs, okay, zero dots, all right. And so this would end up being a formal charge of zero, and that's ideal, you know, if you don't have CNOF, right? You just want to get these to zero as much as, as much as you can. So where does this three come from? It comes from that dot, <coughs> that dot, and that dot. That's where that three comes from. Why is this zero? Because there are no lone pairs on the boron. Like there's just nothing there. Okay, so that's just an example of formal charge. We'll do this so many times it, it, it'll be going out of stuff. Okay. <clears throat> um, questions so far? Okay, so let's do, uh, let's just start doing a bunch of structures. All right, um, let's see. Um, so again, the Lewis structure for, what's the name of this talk now? Then we you get your nomenclature, lithium oxide. Okay, so um, let's go through the steps over and over again. Rinse, wash, repeat. That's what I want to do. Okay, so step one. <clears throat> What's the first step? Is it ionic or covalent? Is it ionic or covalent? Is this an ionic compound or a covalent compound? Ionic. Ionic, right? It's a metal, non-metal. Easiest way to tell, you know. Um, so it's ionic. You wanted to say covalent, I know you did, but it's ionic. Um, so if it's ionic, you have to break up the ions apart. So what are the ions in this formula? Lithium plus. You get lithium plus. You also have another lithium plus, and you also have an oxide two minus. The third step is to count valence electrons for each ion in this case. How many valence electrons are there? Actually, step two is count valence electrons. I was jumping the gun here. Okay, valence electrons for lithium plus. How many valence electrons does lithium plus have? Normally, lithium has one valence electron, right? But what does the plus charge mean? It means you. 
took that electron away. So there are actually zero valence electrons for lithium plus. There are also zero valence electrons for the second lithium ion. For oxide, how many valence electrons does oxide ion have? Six. It had six, but we're going to add two to that count because of the two minus charge. So now I've got eight, val uh, eight valence electrons. All right, the third step is put together the primary framework. Um, since we already have all our valence electrons gone from these, there's not really anything more we can do than to just rewrite the lithium ions over again. Um, what, uh, what is oxide going to look like if I add eight electrons to it? It's going to look like... It's going to look like this. All right, it's going to have its eight dots around it. So does everything have an octet that needs an octet? All right, seen off, oxygen has its octet. So the final structure is simply that structure. All right, it's an ionic compound. The ions aren't covalently bound. You, you put lithium oxide in water, it's going to it's going to dissociate into lithium ions and oxide ions. It's a soluble salt, I'm going back to solubility rules, right? All, all group one cation salts are soluble. Okay, so this would be, if you, if you had uh, Superman vision and you could see at the molecular level in, in a glass of water with some dissolved lithium ox oxide in there, you would see two lithium ions for every one oxide ion. That's what you would see. Okay, okay, and this is what you'd see. You'd see those eight dots around it. You'd say, oh yeah, okay. We're, we're now entering the world of the matrix. Okay, if you remember the movie, all of a sudden, at the end, the guy could see all the binary code on the walls. All right, this is your binary code. All right, you're now going to see molecules in everything you see. Really awesome movie, by the way. I've never seen it. Okay, so let's do another one. My goal is to. Um, oh, by the way, you can put the oxide in the center if you want. Okay, but you don't have to. Okay, here's a, a compound called carbon dioxide, our favorite greenhouse gas. Let's do the same loose structure procedure on carbon dioxide. Okay, uh, what's the first step? Ionic versus covalent. Ionic versus covalent, and what is it? Covalent. It's covalent, right? It's all nonmetals. Right, so it is covalent. If it's covalent, now we can just count all the valence electrons of all the atoms together rather than break it into part like this. Okay. So how many valence electrons total are in carbon dioxide? 16. 16, right? So I've got four from carbon, and I have six from oxygen, and there's two of them. So grand total, I've got 16. Um, now, what, what atom goes in the center? So, in, your, in, in step three, how do you figure out which goes in the center? Does it, does it tell you? It says, um, oh yeah, okay. It doesn't tell you how to. Do you remember how? Uh, there, there's a, there's a, a way to decipher this. Right, so typically the more electronegative atoms go outer. That's one way. Another way to say it is that the atom with the greatest need for an octet goes in the center. Right, so you may have heard that as well. So carbon is four electrons away from becoming like neon. Okay, it's got quite a ways to go to get to get to be like a noble gas. And so um, because of that, it's going to go in the center. Right, the atoms that need more electrons go in the center. The atoms that need less electrons go outer. Okay, but that also falls in line with electronegativity. Um, oxygen is a much more electronegative atom than carbon is, so it's going to go outer. Okay, and carbon uh, has a lower electronegativity, so it goes inner. So low, low electronegativity or 
Another way of saying it is uh, elements that need the most electrons to get their octets also go in the center. But it's the same thing. Right? It's two different ways of saying it. So carbon goes in the center. All right, and we build our basic framework like that. So with every line that we do, we're using two dots. Okay, in high school, Kim, they may teach it like this. They may do that. Okay, I really don't like that though. It's just bad form. I'm sorry. I, I maybe I'm a little snobbish when it comes to my Lewis structures. I, I don't know, but that's. <laughs> I just like to put lines for bonds. Okay. Um, so we have our, our our two bonds. How many electrons did we use up doing that? We used up four. So how many do we have left to work with? We had sixteen. We used up four. We have twelve left. Right, so 12 electrons left. We have to keep accounting for the usage of electrons. So if you like accounting, anyone like accounting in general? No. That's why you're in here taking chemistry. Um, I used to work in an accounting office uh, years ago, and I saw it was just the most boring thing. Like I, I knew a guy who just crunched numbers all day long. Um, so he might like Lewis structures. I should try and contact him. Um, <laughs> you like the counting of electrons? So, um, okay, so we have our basic framework. Um, where do we assign the next 12 electrons? Double bond? Before we make a double bond, before, before we ever make double bonds or triple bonds, we always have to assign all of our electrons first, and then we can assess if we need to double or triple bond. <coughs> Um, so step four says assign remaining electrons to outer atoms first, starting with electronegative first. Okay, right, Yoshi. <laughs> I know my I know this is riveting stuff. Okay. Um, I know it's Saturday. You know. So um, we add pairs of dots to the outer atoms to where they all have octets. If we run out, if we don't add enough, then we have to consider making double or triple bonds. Okay, but we have enough, just enough, to add, up, add, up, uh, add enough electrons to make all the octets for oxygen happy. So we've used up all of our electrons. Okay, after this, we look at um, Step five, which, be, which would be to add any remaining electrons to the inner atoms, but we've run out, so we can't do step five. So we skip over to step six. Okay, what does step six say we have to check? We have to check the octet rule. Okay, and then formal charge. So the octet rule says that CNOF must have eight electrons around them. The oxygens are happy, carbon is not. How do we make carbon happy? Double ones. Okay, right on. All right, so, so I'm going to say skip step five because we already, you know, ran out of electrons. Okay, for step six, checking the octet rule, we're going to go ahead and make a double bond between both um, uh, oxygens and the carbon. Okay, so now we can honestly say, hey, Octets are happy. Um, what about formal charge? So formal charge of carbon, what would that be? Zero. It'd be zero. So what we do is we take the balance uh, count of the free atom, or the group number from the periodic table, that's four for carbon. All right, so is everybody all right with that? How do, where do I get this 4 from? I'm looking at the growth. I'm, I'm subtracting 10 from 14 up there for carbon. But in your periodic table, I believe I have the American labeling in there. So it should say group 4A for carbon. All right, so that tells you there's four valence electrons for the free atom of carbon. So we're going to take that 4, and then we're going to subtract.